Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 16th meeting of Soteria. And it's good to see so many people in attendance today, despite at least where I am, despite the good weather. And we will be hearing Father Frank talking about an Italian writer who I think many people have heard of, but perhaps not so many people have read at all. And that is Malapate. And uh, over to Father Frank Jelly, who I think is known to most of you and who has spoken before at Soteria very well. So I'm sure we will have a very interesting talk on a writer who certainly sounds interesting and about whom I know next to nothing. So um, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I um, would like, first of all, um, how I'm going to structure my talk. Um, I shall um, talk about the uh, Malaparte's biography because actually his novels are largely, at, at least on, uh, on purpose, so at least in a declared way, autobiographical. So his biography is relevant to the books. I will talk also about the aesthetics of his literature, what kind of literature these books are, what, you know, to understand them. And the question of truth, for many of the episodes that you're going to hear about are absolutely shocking. And uh, you may wonder, you know, what's this? It's just mere fantasy. But what if it is truth in St. Cain, what kind of truth? And then uh, the question of morality. Why describe, why write about such horrors? What is there a moral purpose or an immoral purpose? Because as we were saying a moment ago, Malaparte is actually a name which is uh, some sort of joke on uh, um, Napoleon's real name, which was Bonaparte, which literally means from the good side. Mm. Malaparte deliberately twisted it and chose Malaparte from the bad side. But there is actually a, um, another point to be made here, namely that implicitly uh, Malaparte was comparing himself to Napoleon. And that brings out a certain megalomania in Malaparte, which I think was a feature of his personality and indeed of his writings. Um, he says somewhere that uh, uh, Napoleon was Bonaparte, but he ended up badly. Whereas I'm Malaparte and I will end up wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a matter of opinion, I just uh, again to convey. Mm -hmm. So, um, the technique I'm going to use largely um, is to refer to these two books, Caput, um, and as well as The Skin, the two novels. Caput is set in Eastern Europe when uh, the Germans were advancing on the Russian front. And uh, a lot of it actually in Ukraine. So it's kind of topical in that in a <laughs> indirect way. And the skin is about the city of Naples, the uh, ruined, desperate, starved, degraded city of Naples after in post war times, 19, that means 1943, 44. Um, but again, as method, I'm going to. Uh, mention some of the outrageous uh, episodes that Malaparte uh, describes. One is actually um, instead, you said kindly you wanted, it's page, um, it's about a, an in Caput, it's page 266 roughly. I, okay, 266. And I better, yeah. because I also send out a newsletter and not all of you get my newsletter in which I refer to this passage. So this, take your time, Sid, there is no rush. So Malaparte, as a war correspondent, was... Uh, um, can, we, can we see that? Is that uh, yes. 266? Uh, and uh, can everyone see it large enough to be able to read? This is not it, I'm afraid. Ah, it's so, 266, but... Um, yeah, uh, maybe in, in Caput, or maybe the pagination is different. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll uh, go I'll go forward. The passage I wanted, but it, you know, oh, yeah, I don't think you were getting there. Um, you know, uh, let's 
maybe you should forget that because I can actually describe it. Uh, it's my purpose. Now forget it. Uh, stay, uh, stay, uh, stay, uh, we are not doing getting anywhere. Right. Oh, I mean, we've got the the beginning of the of the chapter. Yeah, well, this chapter, because actually uh, the chapter in question, or Pavlovich, is uh, now and um, is page uh, chapter twelve. Okay, right. So I'll yeah, it's called a track. basket of oysters. Ah, yeah. I'll, I'll, if we get to the beginning of that, it's. Uh... And you know, um, I don't want to confuse people. Yeah. So, the Here we are. Ba basket of oysters. Okay, Malaparte is in uh, um, Croatia, which had created uh, declared itself an independent state after the collapse of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in 1941. And the ruler of the new state of Croatia was a man called Ante Pavlic. Ante Pavlic. His title was Poglavnik, which means the right leader of his new state. He was um, fairly tough. He was a nationalist, not a fascist. He was a louder with a fascist Italy, but he was not a fascist. He was a nationalist, extreme nationalist. And um, Malaparte interviewed Pavlic in this guy, he was a big man, Pavlic. Some stage, if you want to Google, you can see photograph on uh, uh, Wikipedia or whatever. There's a big guy with a face. Malaparte has a sort of stupidity, but then he contradicts himself because he says actually he was quite bright. Malaparte has these contradictions. But also Malaparte focuses on Pavlic years. He had big ears, and it's a technique Malaparte uses. Uh, some writers do emphasize one physical feature in order mm. to bring out the individuality of a person. But he says also his ears are also metaphysical. What does it mean to have metaphysical ears? It's fascinating. Mm. Um, now, Malaparte met Pavlic um, twice. The first time, mm. and Pavlic um, I mean, he was a strong leader and accused later of many atrocities. But, but Pavlovich speaks in a very sort of benign way. I want to be like a father to my people. I want to rule people not with uh, violence or cruelty, but with love, with kindness. I, I'm like that. As for Malaparte, he says, I'm almost seduced by the way Pavlovich speaks. Should we, we, we do a reading from this? Um, uh, you want to scroll, you know, actually, um, well, uh, you scroll forward. Uh, go to the next page. Next page, yes, please. N uh, next page. Or... Okay, you said Ante Pavlic. I saw Ante Pavlic the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he uh... describes him. Uh, a little bit, and then you want to. Scroll. Uh, you can see you can see the large ears here, page two five five. Um, should, should someone give? Uh, oh, should, should, should we have a reading from and so when I saw Anti Pavlovich for the first time? Should we do do that to give a bit of flavour? Yeah, okay, let's do it. Um, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, I think it perhaps it'd be nice to ask people to read who are new people, maybe. Michael? Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah, uh, I, I can see Alison in shop. Alison, perhaps you'd like to uh, read from there. Yeah, I think you're, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, ask, yeah, please yes, unmute. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So where, I'm sorry, where, where did it read and, from? And so. And so, I don't, where is that? And uh, so, last oh, paragraph. there, okay, okay. All right, so you want me to read from now, yeah? Yes. Okay, and so, when I saw Anti Pavel for the first time seated at his writing table in a palace in the old city in Zagreb, I felt as if I were meeting an old friend, as if I had known him from time immemorial. I noticed his wide flat face with its hard coarse features. His eyes shone with a deep black fire in his pale earthen colored face. An indefinable air of stupidity was stamped on his face. 
perhaps stemming from his huge ears that seen closely looked even more vast, ludicrous and monstrous than in his portraits. But little by little, it occurred to me that maybe that air of stupidity was only shyness. This sensuous look that his fleshy lips lent to his countenance was practically obliterate, obliterated by the odd shape and unwanted side of his ears, which as compared with those all too fleshy lips seemed too abstract things, too serious, sorry, surrealistic. The realistic shells drawn by Salvador Dal, Salvador oh. Dali, Salvador Dali, two metaphysical objects. Mm. They aroused in me the same impression of deformity as it produced by listening to certain musical compositions by Durius Mill 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 Hord Mill Hord. And Eric Sat Satie, I can't read this. Uh, Satie, Satie. Yeah. Perhaps the association of ideas between music and ears was responsible for this. Okay, no. this is enough. Okay, thank you, thank you, Alison. That's okay. Now, Dr dramatic writing indeed. Yeah. The, um, the next time he sees uh, Pavlovich, is um, is change the composition of his study. And uh, when he walks into published study, almost he bangs his knees against his desk. And Paulish says, well, I've done it to confuse. People who want to kill me, they will not have time to reflect because it will be right in front of me the very moment. And it says uh, Mussolini and Hitler had a huge space interposed between themselves and any visitor. But, but I follow a different technique, and they just have to be they're confused because they come so close to me. But anyway, uh, here, uh, let's cut to the chase. There is a punchline. Uh, Malaparte is seduced by Pavlovich. He feels he's really a good guy, or at least pretends to, and uh, he's about to leave, and he gets up when he sees on Pavlovich's desk there is um, a wicker basket. Lid half open, and it was some kind of jelly-like mess inside. So he asks, uh, excuse me, Poglavnik, the title of Pavlovich, what are those? Are these oysters from your Dalmatian coasts? Pavlovich smiles, a beautiful smile, says, no, they are 40 kilos of human eyes, which my, fa my loyal, faithful Ustashas, my milit uh, militias have given me as a present. So, is it credible that, um, I mean, never mind how fierce Pavlovich was, would have kept a basket of human eyes with human eyes on his desk? It doesn't sound very credible, but here I have a footnote, personal footnote. When I was a young man in Rome, I collaborated with um, a Croatian um, writer in exile, Dr. Ante Cilica. I could go on about him because he was a fascinating guy. And by, I mentioned this episode to Dr. Chilliger. And he said, you know, that's what the Turks did when they occupied the Balkans. They gouged out the eyes. I can't remember. It's, I hope not a, a, a prisoners alive. Well, the dead and kept them in a little, in a little bag by his side, by their side. So, you know, the episode, I don't think it is true in the sense of Pavlovich who had kept uh, human eyes on his desk, but certainly it was a custom which some people have learned in the Balkans because of the uh, Turkish rule. So mm -hmm. uh, I want to say some of the uh, episodes which Malaparte mentions are not necessarily literally true, but they are very similar. Mm -hmm. I like that word, very similar. They like the truth very close to the truth, but, you know, that's quite um, significant. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. okay, um, let's, uh, maybe something a little less um, gory. Uh, in Kaput, he is at having lunch with Harold Nicholson, 
famous English writer and biographer. Mm. Um, I got his biography of King Edward, uh, King George V. And uh, they meet in this restaurant, Sir Oswald Mosley, famous because, of course, he led the British Union of Fascists, eventually interned during the war by Churchill. And now I'm going to read very briefly the uh, dialogue, which uh, part of a dialogue which took place between. Uh, um, um, it says that um, uh, uh, Nicholson says, how will you get into power, Sir Osborne? By the longest way, of course, uh, replied Mosley. Via St. James Park or via Trafalgar Square, asked Nicholson. Via St. James Park, of course, replies Mosley. My coup d'etat will be just a walk over. And he laughed gaily. Oh, I see, your revolution will move from Mayfair. And what? And when do you expect to rise to power, asked Nicholson. The date on which parliamentary regime will reach a crisis in England can be already be reckoned with absolute accuracy. I could make an appointment with you at Downing Street today, replied Mosley. Right, what day, what time, asked Nicholson. Ah, that's my secret, replied Mosley laughing. If a revolution means an appointment, you'd be late in coming into power, said Nicholson. So much the better. I shall come into power where it is least expected, replied Mosley. I think it's quite a, an amusing little dialogue, Sir Oswald uh, cropping up in Caput. Um, of course, he never came to power, but uh, we already know that. But now, um, I said that I want you to talk about the biography of Malpata. I must not forget that. Incidentally, what did he look like? You can see him if you Google him. He was uh, very tall. He was a, a, a born to a, a German father and Italian mother in Prato, which is a, a town near Florence in Tuscany. And so his genes were partly Germanic. Italians are not very tall uh, uh, race. I'm an exception because as people who know, those of you who know me better are immensely tall. Um, when I go to Italy, I sometimes I have a feeling everybody's on their knees because they're much <laughs> shorter than me. But uh, Malaparte was very tall. Also, he was a sharp dresser. He was a bit of a dandy. He had uh, an immaculate uh, clothes and his demeanor was also quite, uh, in a way, it was quite something vaguely aristocratic. He wasn't aristocratic, but you can, you can see he was, uh, to some extent, maybe posturing. Um, so that's his physical appearance. Now, in terms of um, uh, biography, yes, uh, he was born 1898 in Prato. He um, was given actually by, he has a large family, many siblings, but he was given apparently to be brought up <coughs> by some other family nearby. I don't know why. He um, volunteered to serve in the Garibaldi Legion in France when actually before Italy had joined the First World War, but the Garibaldi Legion was disbanded. So he went back to Italy, but joined the Italian army later and served in the um, mountain corps, the Alpini, the famous Alpini, which is a well-known Italian uh, regiment. He joined the fascist party in September 1922. Just, just a month before the famous march on Rome, which uh, took Mussolini to power. And he was a very committed fascist initially. His idea of fascism was more based on uh, revolutionary syndicalism, as uh, described by uh, a French writer Sorel. Uh, he wrote a book about, uh, about that. And actually, even when there was a big crisis after Mussolini got to power, because there was a socialist MP, Matteotti, who had been murdered. Mm -hmm. um, Alaparte kept supporting Mussolini, actually inciting him on, egging him on. Uh, I should also say that he wrote, Malaparte wrote one of his early books, a technique of a coup d'etat. He wrote a book, How to Make a Coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples he gives is actually a march on Rome. But he gives many other examples. And he mentioned Stalin and Trotsky. Trotsky read the book and he was very angry, apparently, with Malaparte. But remember, many people were angry with him yeah. at different times. Um, uh, also, he wrote a book, controversial book, on the Italian defeat 
of a town of uh, an area called Caporetto during the First World War, when the Austro-German army managed to smash through the Italian defenses, there was a big rout and there was a big crisis in uh, for Italian. So it's quite uh, that was written in 1921, at the end of the war, and the book initially was banned in Italy. It was supposed to be disrespectful to the Italian army. Mm. Um, in um, uh, Ernest Hemingway, Farewell to Arms, you have also you find a description of a couple of retro routes, and there was a film with Rock Hudson describe what it was like to be in that kind of situation. Anyway, so he briefly became a diplomat, served in Warsaw, already indicated he was very well connected. He could not join the Italian diplomatic service unless you were well connected. Um, but then uh, he um, uh, became a journalist and he was a correspondent for uh, various important Italian newspapers. In, uh, uh, at some stage in the 30s, he offended one of top fascist leader, uh, Italo Balbo, and Mussolini had him arrested, and Malaparte arrested. He was sent to internal um, exile, called, called, called Fina confinement, which he was sent normally some um, locality in the south of Italy or an island where it kept under control. Mm -hmm. But you were not. Malaparte makes a big meal of having been sentenced to years imprisonment, um, as if he was a martyr. Uh, but he was released very shortly thanks to intervention of his protector. Malaparte had a protector, an angel guardian whose name was Galeazzo Ciano, who was Italy's foreign minister and the son-in-law of Mussolini. He married Mussolini's daughter, Edna. So if you've got that kind of, uh, but he's an object lesser, you know, even if the Church of England, personal or sideline comment, unless you have a protector, a priest will get nowhere. You've got to have someone who looks after you. So, but, you know, that's a sideline. So, um, thanks to Galeazzo Ciano, he was, um, he served, uh, only a couple of years and in, in very nice places. Fought at him army in Tuscany. Not, not that he didn't serve his, his uh, confinement in nasty places. Uh, some stage he had uh, a villa built on the island of uh, Isle of Capri, I think he used to say Capri, um, which was designed by himself. A wonderful cliff top affair, uh, which again was uh, indicating his particular taste or style in which uh, he gave hospitality to all sorts of important people. In Malaparte, you find that most of the people he rubs shoulder with are kings, princes, princesses, dukes, duchesses. You could say he was a tremendous snob. Caput starts with a long conversation with Prince Eugene of Sweden, the brother of King of Sweden. Uh, as if they were, maybe they were on intimate terms, I don't know. And uh, he meets uh, the grandniece of Kaiser Wilhelm at some stage, uh, uh, Princess Louise of von Preussen, and he meets the King of Italy. And, you know, he really is, um, goes to town. There is an element of snobbery, but no doubt he knew those people, but to what extent he did. Um, so, Caput uh, from the Eastern Front of uh, uh, Italy, of course, had joined the Germans, sent an expedition um, to fight along the Germans against the Russians. But Malaparte <coughs> was a war correspondent as well as serving, having his uh, um, military rank. He was a captain in the Alpini. And in Caput, there was long conversations with Hans Frank, who was a general governor of Poland under German occupation. And Malaparte calls Frank the uh, German king of Poland. And um, obviously, he can't be too flattering to, to Frank, because Malaparte describes uh, the Warsaw ghetto, the ghetto in other cities, and the conditions of the Jews there. Although, when Mussolini proclaimed, declared racial laws in Italy in 1938, I think, to follow Nazi Germany, Malaparte did not object. He didn't say it's wrong to have racial laws against the Jews. But here he talks a lot about conditions of the Jews. 
And actually, one of the glorious passages describes a pogrom, a pogrom in the city of Yassi in Moldavia. That was um, uh, Romania. And um, it says some of the Jews have been killed and quartered, and uh, their remains are hung on hooks in butchers' shops for the laughs of the Iron Guards, who were the far right militia in Romania. Now, that seemed to me quite exaggerated. And um, obviously, there were pogroms, which were not new in Eastern Europe. They belong to the history of Eastern Europe. But I, I think that's an example of extreme exaggeration. Um, the glass eye. Did you by chance find the glass eye? Um, instead? Uh, the glass eye is a part in Kapoor. Of... Page um, two. I've got uh, two five six. There is a part okay, I, I try and get that up then. Glass That's a, a short episode, actually. But again, to bring out the inhumanity. And he says that there is a little boy who was a sniper to be sniping over Germans, and immediately he's arrested and the snipers were shot. And the German officer um, questions him and uh, says, almost takes pity and says, look, yeah. I have a glass eye. Nobody can tell which one it is. But if you can tell which is my glass eye, I'll let you free. Um. Father Frank, yeah, I found the glass eye. I mean, should we read a bit from the beginning? Um, you're very keen on this reading. Are people okay for reading? No, I, I think it's a, it's a great thing that, that, okay, that okay, is go keen on, go on that on. because it, read it the glass eye. Go, go on. really brings people into... Okay, do it, do it, do it. Okay, um, and I think um, we had a lady, maybe we'll have a, have a new gentleman, um, Ed, Edward Bentley. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't. I didn't speak to you. Perhaps you'd like to. You want to read um, what's on uh, on the screen? Yeah, right, let's you? right. Let's get it up then. Uh, Walking at Hyde Park right now, so I'm not really able to. Um, the acoustics for Edward Bentley might not be so good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, perhaps one of the other. I mean, do we have a have, have a gentleman? Uh, who's we new? have um, your friend uh, Michael um, from um, somewhere in England. Yeah, I, I just think it'd be nice to have a new, a new voice. Someone new voice, we... okay. I... Um, yeah. So, do, do we have any new, new males? If we don't, then one of the ladies perhaps would like to uh, speak. My, my, Michael. You I mean you know you, you choose one of the ladies then. Uh, uh, ladies. Well, when you put something up on the screen, the names disappear with me. So uh, look I... at look at look at uh, um, oh. participants. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I've got a list here. Hang on just a minute. Uh, uh, I don't know. Who's HH? Yeah, who's HH? And actually, this is only the beginning. The punchline comes much later on, so I'm afraid this will be... Again, you can see here is a Princess Louise from Poitiers. Well, it, yeah, it'd be still good to just, I don't get some sort of up picture. To you, up to you. Um, Oh, um, um, well, I would say HH because I, I'm curious to know who HH yeah. in Germany means Hamburg. Uh, so I don't know what, what, what's going on with the uh, could someone I don't know why someone likes to come up with yeah, the glass side. Yes, HH, perhaps you, you sorry, what's going on? HH, perhaps you'd like to um, uh, give, give that a go. Hello. If not, um, Sabine, perhaps you jump in. Sabine, is it Sabine there? Yeah. Where is she? I've only got a short list. Yeah, don't only have about five people on the short list. This technology is very. Uh, oh, there she is. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. It has one name. Yep. Yeah. Got it. you got Sabine. Sabine, uh, uh, we can't hear you. You may be on mute. I can't no, see. She, she's not on mute. No. Ah. Oh. I think uh, she said that you know, to me she wanted to be quiet. But <laughs> uh, okay. uh, so the, um, in, in that case, we've got um, Zioway. Sorry, I, I pronounced the, the name wrong, I'm sure, but you, you know what I'm trying to uh, say. Yes. Which part do you want me to read? Oh, from, from the beginning, Princess Louise, if you can but, see that. Just one one paragraph? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah let's, let's see how it goes, yeah. Okay, uh, Princess Louise von Preussen, a granddaughter of Kaiser William II, Prince 
Joachim Hohenzollern. Her father, now dead for some years, had been a younger brother of the crown prince, and the Ilse were to meet me that evening at the Potsdam station. We shall bicycle over from Mitten Sea. Ilse had phoned. It was a damp, warm spring evening. When I got off the Berlin train, a light drizzle was scattering silvery dust into the air. The houses at the end of the square looked as though they were made of aluminium. Officers and soldiers stood in group on the pavement before the station. As I was gazing at, the, at a propaganda poster of the Liebstandard, Adolf Hitler stood up on the walls of the station. On the poster, two SS men armed with Tommy guns their faces clean shaven and clear cut, their foreheads concealed under large steel helmet, a cold cruel glint in their gray eyes stood out sharply against a landscape of blazing houses, charred trees and the guns sunk in mud up to the wheel hubs. I felt the hand touch my arm. Good evening, said Ilsa. Her cheeks were flushed by the long bicycle ride. Her hair was ruffled by the wind. Louise is waiting for us outside, she said. She is watching the bicycles. Then she smiled and added, she is very sad, poor child. Be nice to her. Louise had arrested the two bicycles against the lamp post and was waiting for us with her hand on the hand handlebar. How are you? She inquired in that peculiar Potsdam at French, self-conscious and shy. She looked up at me, smiling, her head cocked slightly on one shoulder. She asked me if I had a pump pin. Was I without the pin too? You cannot find a single pin in all of Germany, she said laughing. There was a little tear in her skirt and she seemed to be very concerned about it. She wore a small green felt Tyrolean, I can't read it, Hi. over the nape of her neck and a tobacco-colored tobacco tweed skirt, a leather jerkin of a mannish cut in case at her bosom, bosom, revealing the shortness of her waist and the softness of her hips. Her sock her socks were very short and her legs bare. She was pleased to see me again. Why couldn't I go back with them to Lizenzi? She could certainly find a bicycle for me and I would spend the night at the castle. I could not do it. I was to start the next morning for Riga and Helsinki. Couldn't I post postpone my departure? Lizenzi was very beautiful. It was not really a castle but an old country house surrounded by gorgeous woods. Whole families of deer and a fallow deer lived in the Litzenzee forest. Nature was very lovely and very young there. I think um, that, that would thank, be enough. Thank you. Yeah, that was, thank that you, was nice. Um, fascinating, right? I must ask, because I forget otherwise, what on earth is Potsdam French? I mean, I speak French, but I've never heard of Potsdam French. Right. <laughs> If you don't know, uh, I doubt whether any of us okay. will know. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's terribly relevant. Okay, okay so <laughs> you want to screen forward because the episode of a glass eye, the shocking him, is a, a towards the end of a chapter. You want to screen forward? Um, um... Yeah. Uh, more? Uh, are we in the same chapter? Yeah. Well, I mean, more because it's towards the end of a chapter. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's... Yeah, a bit. I think... Oh, so... Know, well, come back, go back, go back one... Uh, I think it's... This is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Um, so, uh, because you are keen on this reading thing, um, do you want to... So the story is this child who was a sniper. Um, uh, so shall we want... To, do you want to read from... Uh, where did you fire... Why did you fire my men? Right. In the middle, um, in the middle there, yeah. Middle towards uh, here. A bit further down, Stead, a bit further down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you read uh, yourself, Stead? 
So I'm actually struggling. It, it, which is it on the right hand or the no, left? No, it's on the left, left in the middle of the screen. Okay. Um, After near. Near. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. You want to read from there? Yeah. Um, oh, uh, is, is is there no one else new who's got the courage to step forward and uh, read? If not, uh, I, I will do. But uh, no. Um, no, you read it. Oh, I prefer to get someone there. I mean, uh, I, I think we should give a, a bit of reading to our senior attendee, uh, Michael in London. Um, okay, do it. Yeah. My, Michael, if, if you'd be so kind, uh, why did you fire at my men? Why did you fire at my men? The boy looked at the officer with a surprised air. The interpreter repeated the question twice. You know already. Why do you ask? replied the boy. His voice was calm and clear. There was no trace of fear, no indifference in his tone. He faced the officer squarely and before answering came to attention like a soldier. Do you know who the Germans are? Asked the officer in a low voice. Aren't you a German yourself? To a varish officer? Counter the boy? The officer made a sign and the Feldwebel Feld grasping the boy by the arm took his gun from his belt. Not here, farther away, said the officer, turning his back. The boy moved off, taking quick steps so as to keep up with the Feldwebel. Suddenly, the officer turned, raised his riding whip, and shouted, Ein Moment. The Feldwebel turned, looked perplexedly at the officer, and came back, pushing the boy with his outstretched arm. <laughs> what time is it? asked the officer. Without waiting for a reply, he began to pace up and down in front of the boy, striking his boots with a riding whip. The horse pulled at the reins and followed, snorting and shaking its head. Finally, the officer stopped uh, before the boy, stared at him for a long time in silence, then said in a slow, tired voice, full of boredom, listen, I don't want to hurt you. You are a child and I'm not waging war against children. You have fired at my men, but I am not waging war on children. Liebergott, I am not the one who invented war. The officer broke off and then went on in a strangely gentle voice. Listen, I have one glass eye. It is difficult to tell which is the real one. If you, if you can tell me at once without thinking about it, which of the two is the glass eye, I will let you go free. The left eye replied the boy promptly. How did you know? Because it's the one that has something human in it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. That's not it, It's a great punchline. It it's is. Actually, yeah. at the end of a chapter, <laughs> Malaparte's own line is all Germans have a glass eye. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, in that sense, uh, it is. Uh, okay, so as time is marching away, I think it's time for me to go into the, the skin, the second novel by Alparta, because it would be lovely to talk to you. Now, there are many memorable things. One, but one of the most memorable is the siren, the episode of the siren. Did you get that? Um, um, if not, it doesn't matter. I can describe it. Uh, what, what, I mean, I've, I've got it on page 116. Uh, the siren is 225. Okay, I'll try. But do get we that. have time to read on? To read on? I mean, uh, because what time do you finish this? We usually take uh, between one and a half hours and two hours for the whole thing. Oh, okay, okay, fine by me. I mean, I'm quite happy to. But I don't want to. So, okay. That is um, a famous, um, absolutely superb. Page 225. Right. Uh, yeah. Almost, uh, it's just uh, slightly difficult to get the. Uh, unfortunately, you can't type in a uh, page and it goes to it. Uh, okay, well, do you want no, me? No, no, I'm, I'm almost at the. Um, do you want me to tell you what the story is? Uh, we're, we're here. To, um, I think this is uh, 225. Yeah, uh, right, no, just just go back. Yeah, I'm on 225. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll share. Yes. Uh, so just to give you background so you may understand what it is. There is a, there is a dinner 
at the house of General Cork, um, a, um, not the house, actually, in a palace. General Cork is actually a pseudonym for General Mark Clark, who was an uh, American commander in Italy. And um, uh, uh, this dinner, uh, because um, Naples, uh, there was a prohibition by the Allies to, to fish in the Gulf of Naples for various reasons. So they had to get fish from the aquarium of Naples. And they bring in this, uh, the only fish left in the aquarium of Naples. And so they're having this dinner. And um, it's... Um, we, um, where we, want, we want to start reading from the page 225. Yeah, and what, uh, all, all around was silent? No, or? no, it, it gets too long. Uh, uh, it's, no, no, no. It's not, no, it's, this is not the page. This is not the page. I'm sorry. So, should I go forward? Um, You're on 255, not 225. Um, oh, two two. Sorry, is it, you say two two five, Frank. Two two five. Sorry, that's my mistake. It's sorry. General Cork's banquet. Uh, sorry, it's. Uh... Right now, this should be two two four when it comes, and then we can. Uh... Okay. Two, two, four, and it's two two five. Uh, you you were a moment ago. You were on the page. Two two ah oh, two two six right. So now this should be two two five. Uh, right. yeah, but go back one page. Okay, what two two uh, two. Go, two two three? Go to two two three. Yeah. Okay, so there is this. Uh, uh, okay, go if you. If you go down to where, uh, yes, uh, it was worth losing the war. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to read yourself? No. Um, I, um, uh, Michael in in um, uh, in Cologne, maybe you, you, you should. Uh, sure, why not? Uh, it, from it was worth losing the war. Yeah. Yeah. It was worth losing the war just to see those American officers and that proud American woman sitting pale and horror stricken round the table of an American general on which in a silver tray reposed the body of a siren, a sea goddess. Disgusting, exclaimed Mrs. Flat, covering her eyes with her hands. Yes, I mean, yes, stammered General Cork, pale and trembling. Take it away, take this horrible thing away, cried Mrs. Flat. Why, I said, it's an excellent fish. But there must be some mistake. Please forgive me, but there must be some mistake. Please forgive me, stammered poor General Cork with a wail of distress. I assure you that it's an excellent fish, I said. But we can't eat that girl, that poor girl, said Colonel Elliot. It isn't a girl, I said, it's a fish. General, said Mrs. Flat in a stern voice, I hope you won't force me to eat that, this, that poor girl. But it's a fish, said General Cork. It's a first rate fish. Malaparte says it's excellent. He knows. I haven't come to Europe to be forced to eat human flesh. By your friend Malaparte or by you said Mrs. Flat, her voice trembling with indignation. Let's leave it to those barbarous Italians to eat children at dinner. I refuse. I am an honest American woman. I don't eat Italian children. I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry, said General Cork, mopping his brow, which was dripping with perspiration. But in Naples, everyone eats this species of child. Yes, I mean, no, I mean that, that species of fish. <laughs> Isn't it true, Malaparte, that that species of, of fish is excellent? It's an excellent fish, I replied. And what does it matter if it looks like a child? It's a fish. In Europe, a fish doesn't have to look like a fish. Nor in America, said General Cork, glad to find at last someone who would stick up for him. What? cried Mrs. Flat. In Europe, I said, fish at least are free, 
No one says that a fish mustn't look, look like, what shall I say, a man, a child or a woman. And this is a fish, even if, anyhow, I added. What did you expect to eat when you came to Italy? The corpse of Mussolini? Ah, that's funny, roared General Cork, but his laughter was too shrill to be genuine. Ah, ha! And all the others joined in, their laughter a strangely conflicting blend of dismay, doubt and merriment. Mm. I have never loved the Americans. I shall never love them in the way I did that evening as I sat at that table, confronted by that horrible fish. Okay, well, I mean, thank you, Michael. Okay. That was so, okay, clearly this cannot be true because you cannot have... Uh, now, the, 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 in, in uh, the book, the, uh, the dish is referred to as a siren. Now, first, the qualification. There's a difference between a siren and a mermaid. A siren uh, in, uh, doesn't look like a fish, it's a mythological speaking. A siren uh, is not um, human from the waist up and fish from the waist down. A siren is, um, that is a mermaid. The word is mermaid. The mermaid is uh, partly fish-like, not a siren. The siren is just different, a uh, particular voice and looks more like a bird. But you could say that's beside the point. But is there an element, a slight element of a very similitude in this episode? Now, we know from um, Norman Lewis, there's another writer, an Englishman, who wrote a book about Naples in war time. It talks about Joe, um, American generals have been served a girl, a baby manatee, a baby manatee. You know, you know what a manatee is? No, a manatee no. well, is, sea, a sea cow. is a mammal. Yeah. Oh. The mammal, which sometimes carries a sea cow. Now, it doesn't look uh, human, but you could say with a stretch of imagination, you could say it's a vaguely humanoid shape. They, uh, uh, so we go back to the question, maybe uh, there was, but Malaparte, if he knew the episode, he decided to exaggerate it, make it shrimp, to convey me, because Malaparte speaks of time, the liberation of Naples by their lives, but sometimes the occupation of Naples. And although he describes the Americans in many ways as very uh, uh, positively, but he also said we, they didn't really know the culture of a place where they landed. You know, this is not a, 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 a recent story. They invaded Iraq, but did not bother to find out what the Iraqis are like. And that crea crea created a kind of catastrophe. So, um, he's just conveying the surreal element, and, uh, but, but also the atrocity, the, uh, the absurdities. But I want to now to mention, uh, to, to again, to uh, try to be a, a big theme. Another episode, a chilling episode, we don't have to go, is the child market in Naples. Malaparte describes a spot in Naples where mothers brought the children for sale to be sold, to be bought by Moroccan soldiers in the uh, French army occupying, part of the occupying forces in Naples. Now, this is pretty terrible stuff. Um, again, there is a, a vague element. I don't know if the people were so desperate to sell their own children, um, but um, where well, I'm trying to find the passage here. Um, okay, page 119. I think I've got it. Yes, yes. Um, it speaks of, um, uh, I had stopped in the middle of the piazza of the Cappella Vecchia, and I was looking up at Lady Hamilton's windows. Lady Hamilton, of course, Emma Hamilton, was a mistress uh, time years before of uh, Horatio Nelson, and the wife of uh, uh, Sir William Hamilton, the uh, British Consul in Naples. And I was unwilling to drop my eyes and look about me. I knew what I should see there in front of me at the foot of a wall, the forms of background of a courtyard. I knew uh, there is in, in, there in front of me a few yards from where I stood was at the child market. I knew that today, as on every other day, 
at this hour, at this moment, boys from eight to 10 years old who were sitting half naked in front of a Moroccan soldiers were observing them closely, picking them out and coming to terms with the horrible, toothless women, gaunt face and weasel and plaster with rouge who trusted in those children. And so the Moroccan soldiers came and bought those children at the price of a few pennies. They felt them and lifted up their garments, sticking the long extra black fingers between the bottom of the knickers and holding them up to indicate the price. Ah. Was there a child market in Naples? What did people sell their children out of starvation or despair? It's impossible to say. Um, certainly, I'm afraid uh, this is um, not something which I find easy to say, but uh, the Moroccan soldiers, the French army, raped a number of women in Italy. And um, Norman Lewis uh, describes all the manner of raping one stood in front of a woman and uh, raped her from the front, the other, another Moroccan soldier from the back, sodomized the woman from the back. Now, this is not a fantasy because the Italian government after the war gave pensions to some of the women who had been raped. And the Italian writer Alberto Moravia, who certainly was not on the right, wrote a book about that, La Chachara, a novel about these women who had been raped. Um, it was a film with Sophia Loren playing one of his women. So, um, this is not to indict, uh, you know, it, it, it's the horrors of war. And Mama Pata brings it out to, to, you know, what could be worse? Because Neapolitans adore children. Children, like in many Latin cultures, are very important. So, to arrive at that point, I mean, not everybody, not every, but in some cases, it just illustrates the, the horror of a degradation. Now, another important passage, or more a passage actually is, which is actually very tricky to mention, is homosexuality. Now, another party could not write that today because he was accused of homophobia and it would be uh, banned. But he says, and I'm reading very briefly here, uh, and there were words which were used at the time for, for gays, inverse, invertiti, or a more sort of elitist word, Uranians, because of uh, worshipping the cult of the uh, Aphrodite Urania, a heavenly, heavenly cult. Do you remember, I mean, Oscar Wilde, it's, it's a wonderful uh, vice, you know, it's a wonderful vice. Anyway, so very briefly, the international community of inverse tragically disrupted by the war, was reconstituting itself in the first trip of Europe to be liberated by the handsome and light soldiers. A month had not yet passed since its liberation, and already Naples, the noble and illustrious capital of the ancient kingdom of the two Sicilies, had, be, had become the capital of European homosexuality, the most important world center of forbidden vice, the great Sodom to which all the inverse of the world were flocking. And he says, incidentally, they gazed at, uh, with hung and gazed with hungry eyes at the handsome brush shoulders, pink face American British soldiers, and they forced them away from the crowd. So, and if that goes on for um, several pages, and he describes speaks of homosexuals and in mincing ways, uh, and the malice of homosexuals and so on. Um, again, words which will not be allowed today. But of course, it, it, part of was straight. But if you read Marcel Proust, uh, one of the uh, volumes of La Recherche d'un Perdu, one of the volumes entitled Sodom et Gomorrah. And Proust uh, describes uh, the plight of being gay not all that differently from the way in which Malaparte does. But of course, at the time, being gay was a secret thing, so there was a cult of secrecy. I had a friend who once who told me, called um, the gay network the Homintern. The Homintern, which was a joke, you know, there was internet, Commerce International was a uh, uh, Comintern after the war, and then there was Homintern. But anyway, I mean, obviously, this is. And he focuses on a particular 
uh, gay friend, a certain Jean Louis, who despite the name was an aristocrat um, from an ancient Milanese family, having a beautiful face, a little ruby lips, and coveted by everybody around, even with Moroccans who gaze on him with hungry eyes. Now, but um, uh, I, my personal theory is Jean Louis was actually a uh, disguised representation of Lucchino Visconti. And Lucchino Visconti, another film director, was also a member of an ancient aristocratic family in Milan, the Visconti family. They'd been ruler of Milan, and Visconti was a communist and was gay, very well known. Now, um, and Baba Parchet talks about uh, all these uh, gay people in Naples have their all um, embraced uh, Marxism. Marxism had become a combination, a combined Marxism with pederasty. Become, so it, 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 it's quite a powerful uh, thing. As I say, today it will not be allowed. But also he goes on to disguise invited by Jean Louis to a particular right, real or uh, invented, I don't know, which took place in some, some place near Naples where there was, uh, assuming he was gay, uh, he was a um, certain chichilla, he was giving birth. He was giving birth to a, a, a Balfarty described to a, a kind of freak and surrounded by um, admiring and uh, cheering uh, crowd of inverts. So uh, that again is a strong theme in, uh, in uh, La Pelle. Um, I um, mentioned some, maybe something a little bit more lighthearted when uh, the American armies uh, rolled into liberated Rome, there were the tanks, there were the jeeps, and General Cook, as I say, General Cook meant General Clark, Mark Clark. They passed in front of a Colosseum. Imagine the mass of a Colosseum, the Lafayette, and General Cook stood on his jeep and said, wow, I was Bombers have done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've heard that's a trip to Jerusalem. <laughs> and then Malaparte, he turned to me, yeah. I'm sorry, Malaparte, this is war. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, incidentally, a book uh, full of digs of the Americans being, in a way, lovely, but also somewhat uh, not really knowing much about uh, culture and history. And yeah, um, now, um, is there anything? Well, uh, the book actually ends in, uh, with an, an eruption of uh, Vesuvius, a volcano, so it's a suitable. But the last horrific scene, which is, uh, he's again implausible because he's giving uh, hospitality in a, in, a, uh, in a flat in Rome by uh, a physician who has in various glass, um, Files, he's got uh, various fetuses, uh, abnormal fetuses, which are um, uh, they're never born because they have two heads or uh, a single eye, and of the Malaparte exaggerates. And he has this vision of fantasy, call it what you will, of Mussolini's feet, Mussolini, like a huge fetus. If you saw what the parties are, what they did to Mussolini's body in mm -hmm. Piazza Loreto. Uh, in, in Milan after liberation, they hit the, you know, the body of being outraged. And, uh, I mean, you know, think of Gaddafi in Libya in more recent times. Um, and um, Malaparte has this conversation, this fetus of Mussolini, which is actually something compassionate and pitiful. Um, and it, 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 it's quite, it's very striking. Um, now, shall I talk a little bit about um, um, be, uh, and at any time, if you want to interrupt, um, Malaparte, of course, he was not allowed to uh, visit Naples for years. He would have been lynched for what he wrote. Uh, he went on to um, write a book about his fellow Tuscans, Maledetti Toscani, or Cursed Tuscan, which he described his own, I think my mum was Tusc from Tuscan actually. So I was in Tuscany as a boy several times on holiday. And the Tuscan people are, you know, they have some peculiar, they're quite bitchy people. They can be quite um, tricky people to be with. Uh, as I said, my mum was a Tuscan, and so I'm half Tuscan myself, you know. 
Um, and I thought, I mean, I said, I'm an Etruscan. Well, my mum from a part of Tuscany, I'm sure Etruscan, so I think I'm a bit of an Etruscan. Mm. Um, but, um, but also his last book, he had a trip to Russia and China. And he wrote a book, I am in Russia and China. And actually, I remember people commenting, ah, this is really Malapartian. It's I. It's Malapartian, I. She's ranging over everything. It's megalomania. Um, in Russia, all, um, back in 1956, the time of the Hungarian uprising, he did not condemn the, the uh, Russian uh, crash of the Hungarian uprising at all. Indeed, he defended the Russian regime. And then China, he interviewed Mao Zedong. He uh, was very full of praise for China and everything else. Then in China, he developed the first symptom of the cancer, which eventually was going to kill him. And the Chinese looked after him in a big clinic. He was very grateful. What he did, he, before dying, in his will, he left his wonderful house in Capri to the Popular Republic of China. But his heirs contested it, and so he was not given to the Chinese. Uh, you know how it's tricky it is. As a, as a full-time clergyman in the past, I had to deal with people with wills, and the worst yeah. side of human nature comes yeah. out when people have to talk about wills and everything. Yeah. 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 So he had cancer. Initially, he pretended it wasn't cancer. He said something else. Tuberculosis, or whatever. But he had been a heavy smoker all his life, as you can see. He had a pancreatic, I think it was pancreatic, no, lung cancer, lung cancer. And at the time, um, I don't know if it's treatable today, but at the time it was not treatable. So he was in a clinic and he said, Oh, when I came back from China, I had no money. I had to, a friend lent me money to be in that private clinic. Was it true? He didn't have any money. Well, then again, it's a bit of a, uh, maybe a bit of deliberate moan. Um, now, Malaparte, prior to that, had tried to rejoin, to join the Communist Party. But they did not accept him because there were too many people, many ex-fascists, actually. We don't want this guy into the Communist Party. Yeah, this guy had been a fascist. We don't want him. Uh, Gramsci, the famous Gramsci, famous mm. ideologue of Marxist, uh, he died in prison, but in a previous, uh, in uh, right from prison, he said Malaparte was a despicable man capable of all the possible infamies in the book. And many other uh, communists, uh, you know, but the leader of the Communist Party, Palmiro Togliatti, um, who had been uh, in exile in Russia for a long time, in, uh, in, in Russia, they devoted a city to him. There is a city called Togliatti, in, 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 still in, today in Russia, which was a car making factory, uh, maybe still is. Uh, Togliatti actually, Togliatti was clever. He thought probably uh, uh, Malaparte became a journey Communist Party with a big, big fish to catch. So apparently Togliatti gave him uh, the, the card of the Communist Party. But it wasn't quite clear, there was also a cancer of this. Um, but if you like, there is another aspect that um, Jesuit priests visited Malaparte in his bed, in his clinic. And converted him. That is a story. Was converted. I remember when they lived in Italy. Uh, the story was there was a judge called Father Morion, who ferociously revealed to Malaparte, "You are dying of cancer." Malaparte didn't know, and Malaparte was so, or pretending not, was so frightened that it was accepted with baptized. He was baptized with water from a glass, and received communion. But other accounts said it was famous Padre Rotonde, who was a famous Jesuit at the time, who was involved in this. But some people say, no, they, they, they just made it up. I can't believe the priests made it up. I think there was, a, there was some truth there. The Malaparte, uh, just the fear of, 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 the, of the next, the world beyond the grave, uh, you know, sometimes it can make strange effects on people. Um, I should say that Malaparte also had a go at um, cinema. He wrote the um, script for a film in kind of forbidden, in kind of forbidden Christ, Cristo Proibito, um, which did not have much success, but um, it was um, it was given some uh, 
um, acknowledge them at the Festival of Cards. Not in vain, it's because the Italians are a bit, uh, they are not said very much on our part. Um, but more bits of gossip and everything else, which I could spin out of on Malaparte, uh, one piece of gossip, because he had many lovers, he was not married, but he had several lovers, he had no children, I wonder why, um, and um, suppose that one of his lovers was a member of the Agnelli family, the famous... Um, mm. uh, Fiat, the, Fiat uh, isn't it? Yeah, the owners of the Fiat car factory, and uh, there is a rumour that um, Gianni Agnelli, who later on became, was uh, his son, but I don't know, but, but, uh, um, I should say, I've been to Naples only once, which was actually a dozen years ago, at the invitation of a friend of mine, an Italian, who were converted to Shia Islam. He organized a, a gathering of um, uh, Shia Muslims in Naples, a conference in, Tal in pure Islam, the pure Islam, and I gave a talk there, and it was my opportunity to visit this place in which uh, I'd never seen in my life. Oh, Rome, my birthplace, is very near Naples. And my family didn't like Naples. My mum, oh, we had negative reference to Naples, implying that they were sort of below par people. Mm -hmm. um, funnily enough, I have uh, cousins, cousins in Naples because my, my father, he was from Romagna, more up north, and, but his brother, Amerigo, went to Naples, settled in Naples, made money, had a string of, um, how do you say, lavanderia in Italian, uh, what is it? Uh, um, laundries, no. Laundry, laundries. Yeah, yeah laundries. Yeah. Laundries, and um, by rich. Unfortunately, America would come to visit us from time to time. And you know, I was a, a boy, a little boy. He never brought me a present. <laughs> never, never, he go to visit a family where there is a young boy. He never brings me a present. And you are rich. So he says a lot of, uh, Marigo, but he was on here, but uh, we, he died, of course. Um, uh, I'm glad my like my dad died of cancer. Smokers, smokers, that was, uh, that did it. And um, I got, I would have first cousin in Naples, but we're not in touch, I'm afraid. But Naples was an absolutely tremendous city. And uh, if Naples knew how to um, uh, valorize itself uh, where such a world exists. Naples would be more interesting than Istanbul. You know, it's a great place. Yeah, I do like the Neapolitans. Neapolitans have interesting faces. They're remarkable faces, uh, individual faces. How, 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 how do you mean? How do you mean? Well, you have to look, but, but they have strong faces. Not, not nasty faces, but features are kind of strongish nose and cheeks and everything else. At least that's my impression. You know, I had several bars and uh, restaurants were mm, mm, mm. and um, And he said, uh, going back for a moment to Malaparte, Malaparte had this, uh, um, I think it was Flaubert, a great French writer, who said to people who want to learn to be good writers, you see that dustman over there. You've got to give me a description of, dust, of that dustman in a way which makes different from all other dustmen. You had to individualize that person. And uh, we talked about the ears of uh, mm -hmm. Ante Pavlovich. And another example is Rommel. Because Rommel visited um, Malaparte on Isle of Capri once. And, uh, and he said Rommel had a quite a distinct head, elongated head. And I think that is true. I've seen photographs of Rommel. The top of his head was quite elongated in a way. I mean, nothing uh, abnormal or monstrous, mm. but it's a way of catching a distinctive feature of a person. Well, mm. part of hand they give, so to speak. Um, now, of course, um, Malaparte was um, uh, quite sensational, sensational from the after the war in Italy and everything else. Then he underwent some kind of eclipse. Never in France. In France, uh, Malaparte is much more uh, appreciated and really write about him or the other. Mm. If you read the Wikipedia French article on Malaparte, it's quite positive. The Italian one is less positive, the English mm. one, mm. I don't know. Interesting. But, um, well, I personally think I've nearly come to the end of what I wanted to say, but are you, if anybody wants to jump in and... 
<laughs> what? Yeah. Well, I think we had lots, lots of things people want. So I thought it was absolutely excellent, five and extremely stimulating. And uh, I have far too much to say, so I'll have to be restrained. Uh, oh, I, and perhaps in in summary, you, you could say, Father Frank, what you think are the, are the great virtues of his, oh, right. his writing. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed. Good, yeah. Actually, thank you for reminding me because I wanted uh, a good uh, point. Oh, yeah. But already, I was true, but the morality. Well. One, some people have accused Malapato of reveling on those horrors, mm. of making um, literature a success out of uh, horrific episodes. Mm. But there's another way of looking at it. Uh, the Malapato wanted to convey the horrors of war, the horrors of war. And right now we are seeing in Ukraine an example of that being in some extent, not quite the same, but they were created. So, he was not a pacifist in the way in which uh, Henri Barbus, famous French writer, was, or Remarque, who wrote nothing new on the Western Front. No, he was not a pacifist, but he was, you know, he was on the side of ideology and uh, supporting the Soviet Union. But um, certainly one thing that comes away from the, reading these books is the horrors of war. So in that sense, you could say in Malaparte, there is a moral lesson to be drawn, to be got out of there. Um, in, you cannot, in a way, I don't know if they're using the word whitewash is right, but it's quite clear Malaparte flirted with various ideologies. I mean, uh, sometimes I like compared to Danuzio. The Danuzio, Italian poet, also used to sit on the, on the right of Italian parliament, and one day in the middle of the debate, he got up and walked across to the left and sat on the left. I'm a man of life, I'm a poet. I'm standing for the people of life. Now, you could argue that's right, wrong, just standing with the left of life. But again, he's just flirting with the ideologies. And uh, obviously today, he would not be popular uh, to uh, to get one's allegiance to yeah. him. But, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Father Fett, you, you think, I mean, uh, that he, he has a, a, a genuine dislike of cruelty rather than a slightly morbid oh, right. fascination with it. I uh, thank you for reminding me because actually one passage, one important uh, passage, which would endear Malaparte to the eyes of many animal rights people, was a chapter about vivisection. Malaparte had a dog, a dog called Pedro, uh, not Pedro, Pedro. <laughs> Pedro is probably a reference for God. Um, one of the names of Apollo, and he, he was immensely attached to this uh, dog. He loved this dog. It was a real relate. And many people have a dog, but do feed that way. Mm -hmm. When on one occasion, Fedo went missing. He could not find him. Now, in the Italy of my days, there was a figure called the Accalapia Khan, which means the dog catcher. The one who went around, I remember seeing once a van of the of dog catcher, and he saw, if he saw straw dogs, so dogs with no um, uh, muscle, oh, no. You know, no one, he would, um, he had a kind of lasso. <laughs> he throw the lasso, grab the poor animal into a little van and drag him away. And he would be taken to be, to be killed. Oh, and in this version, uh, Malaparte visits the place and finds there are a number of dogs which are used for vivisection. They've been cut open, yeah. they're in trays, fully shown, and he sees, he recognizes Fado there, his own dog, which looks at him with eyes, the pity of his eyes, you know, you have to read the description. Now, now the punchline is even more horrific, and if all the dogs are not yelping and not um, making any sound, so he asks, the, let's call him a surgeon in charge. So the, why uh, the dogs not say, not make any cry? And the man replies, well, before the operation, we cut off the vocal cords. That, that I have to put in that is what Bayersdorf, the manufacturers of Nikia cream make, do with their animals. Well, I mean, you know, it, it is a very strong statement against the section and yeah. against, uh, I know it's certainly in this country, in England, it's very today, you, I don't think you do that, it's forbidden. And there are also the restrictions about what you can do to animals, experiments on. But in, in clearly, quite clearly, um, 
it, it is a horrific and animal lovers or people who care about animal welfare would be sympathetic. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, uh, oh, thanks I, for reminding me, I forgot to mention. Mm. Uh, I, uh, p p perhaps it would be good to open up to other people. I mean, uh, as Michael, you said, you, you've got a lot of points to make, and I could certainly say things, but it, it's nice to give guests the uh, okay. uh, right, maybe. Sabine, I can see Sabine has told us, Sabine Matters. She's a wonderful friend of mine from Germany. She often comments on my email. I think she wants to keep quiet. Uh, that's a shame. She's um, a great admirer of the late uh, Mark Gaddafi. Oh, it. <laughs> I think the oh. statement was to prompt her to say something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe say something that isn't true about her that she'll have to unmute to, to, to sort of like, contradict or something. Um, uh, I mean, Prudence, yeah, do you have any, any uh, talks? I was, sorry, I was going to ask you to read, but you didn't, didn't, we didn't, didn't have No, we didn't, didn't, didn't get a chance, uh, no. Uh, um, no. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I knew the name Malaparte, but I didn't know anything about him. This is an absolutely fascinating introduction. and. The examples we've read, we've looked at, do seem to me precisely to be the work of a satirist showing the horrors of abuse of power and of war. It, it seems, it, it looks, yeah, um, not, not perhaps entirely infused with righteous anger and um, polemic, but almost a, a horrified, rueful, view of what human beings can get up to so um yes <laughs> um and i i do think also his, his descriptions are very good he has a, a wonderful way of bringing a visual scene alive so, so those those two things came out initially but as as the discussion goes on no doubt i'll chip in again <laughs> of course we're we're reading english extracts and presumably he wrote mm. all of these in Italian, uh, Father Frank. So that was... I don't have. Uh, I mean, obviously, when I was a young man, a boy, I read him in Italian, but I no longer have the ah. Italian version. I'm afraid many of my books have gone and they've been dispersed. Uh, oh, but see. I'm sure it's a, it's translations read very well. Yeah, they do. They 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 do. Mm. Um, but uh, of course, it, yeah. Uh, and they what you've read of trans in translation corresponds with with what you remember, perhaps, in the Oh, original. absolutely, yes. Yeah, um, yeah. But also, um, our part, uh, in all in all, so there are lots of chunks of dialogues in French or in German, in Caput, there is a lot of German, but also a lot of French. Mm. Mm. French at the time was the language of diplomacy, the language mm. of culture. Yeah. So in a way, it, I think our part was partly uh, relating a real dialogue, partly maybe again showing off. Mm. Mm. I, I think I would throw in because it, it, it's a rhythm translation. You said there were more than one translation. There was more than one translation of Malaparte's work. Um, from your knowledge of Italian, can you recommend one translation more than another? Or well, I mean, I, well, all I can say is um, that the, the one of the scheme translated by, um, I think I mentioned before, I'm going back to Chase or some, uh, I can probably find it. Uh, no, this, this one is by David Moore. Oh. Introduction by Rachel Kushner. David Moore, introduction of one is an American. Movie. The uh, Caput is Cesare Folli. Oh. But I think they both read very well. They, do, they sound very good, yes. And that makes an enormous difference to one's appreciation of foreign writers, because if you have a bad translator, that can prejudice no, no, you unfairly. Not bad mm. no. Yeah, a professional. And he and he must be difficult to translate because I, I would see him as, as playing on words a lot, not only in his name, but there must be lots of wordplay in the Italian. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yes, um, well, that's, that's uh, inevitable. <coughs> it's inevitable. I mean, uh, I suppose also it, yeah. mean, the French expression to translate as a betray. Yes. Traduire. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but, I mean, otherwise you would not be accessible to the wider public. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Alison, any, any uh, comments or HH um, or Zalway? Uh, is someone about to speak? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, please tell us. Yeah. 
But um, would you describe uh, Malapati as um, uh, Salvador Dali of the literature? Because the, oh. from the way he describes things in like a surrealistic way, he's more like, uh, sort of like a postmodernist artist, that sort of, um, I'm not so sure. Yes, I mean, uh, but it's something Dali-esque in, uh, in mm -hmm. uh, some of his passages of his prose. Um, so, uh, yeah, surreal is a word which has been used, but it's surreal. Um, I don't think there is much nastiness in Dali. Mm. I think Dali describes... Um, uh, he was a great mercenary, of course. Uh, I so regret when I was in New York, I failed to see his um, um, a wonderful painting of Conquest of the Americas. Yeah, in some place you well, I'm afraid I failed to say it, but it looks very, but um, I think uh, it is a surreal end. I mean, in Malaparte, the surreal is a uh, slanted with the direction of the very often the horrific, but there are passages, I mean, there is um, which are quite humorous. For example, someone just asked Malaparte to describe the relationship between Mussolini and the Pope. Uh, that's I'm not going to read out unless you want it, but I mean, it's quite humorous. So he describes uh, uh, Mussolini taking charge of Italia all his life. And when he dies, he hands him over to uh, So that's quite a humorous passage. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but on the whole, uh, you know, there's an emphasis on the, uh, the whole uh, I, I I would have thought that he would need to write uh, about more uh, sort of counterfactual things to really get to the position to be thought of as a literary equivalent of Dali, i.e. soft watches and things like that, which are a beautiful image as well. Most of the material we've talked about is is stuff that could be true, it might not be true, but somehow seems to represent a truth. Uh, in very way. similar. Yeah, as you said, that word very similar, which is a very good a good mm. thing to remember, isn't it? Um, and, and, a, and a part of that, well, a little bit later than Dali, of course, but part of that modernist strand in in European art generally, um, modernism as a way of kicking over tradition, showing the uh, the shortcomings of tradition, in order then to to create something new. Mm. And I'm seeing I'm seeing that the brutality of modernism in in his method, uh, as with Dali. Yes, uh, I mean, um, yeah, postmodernism is, is, uh, is uh, definitely uh, it fits. Mm. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned Milan Kundera, who commented mm. in Malaparte very positively, and I myself, I kind of admire Milan Kundera's literature. But Milan Kundera, I mean, a lot of Milan Kundera, uh, what he writes, is a love affairs, a description of um, you know, sex, sexual mm. relationships. Now, uh -huh. I say in, in Malaparte, there isn't really any, um, if we are the sexual reference, that's so, no. not very nice. Um, so, um, so he doesn't do a relationship, really. He, he obviously wasn't very uh, interested in, if, if at all capable of, personal maybe, relationship. Yeah, was interesting the love story. I suppose he mm. could have written about love stories. Did he write um, about friendships and um, family relationships? Good before? question. Yes, I mean, uh, obviously, um, but maybe pages were, but um, uh, it seems, uh, you know, admiring a number of, uh, usually the women you admire, again, the sort of aristocratic friends. Ah. We, we is from Poisson. Mm. Mm. Um, they're, they're not quite ordinary. The, the traditionalism, or, or the, 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 as you said, the uh, 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 um, enjoyment he seemed to, to find in moving in aristocratic circles. That doesn't seem to, does that correspond with any beliefs he had? I mean, he, he, was he someone who thought it was important for the, the, the structure of society whereby there are aristocrats to continue and this was a, a, a beneficial thing or any? Well, I mean, I wouldn't want to build it into an ideology or yeah. a political prescription, not quite often because he was, um, so especially later on in his life, inclined to communism. Yeah, yeah and uh, of course, incidentally, um, he was a war correspondent on the Eastern Front and wrote several uh, uh, articles. And the Germans complained. 
But you have to complain because they said these articles are too uh, not sufficiently negative about the Russians or the Soviets. And actually, I used to have a book with some of his articles, um, again, it's gone. But um, they were not, you know, he's not writing as an, an anti communist writer describing uh, the horrors of Stalin or Soviet Russia. Quite the opposite. He's, he's not a, at all like that. Uh, um, so, um, but that doesn't mean, uh, towards the, later on in his life, yes, appreciated Mao, uh, never condemned uh, really Stalin, but I wouldn't build into a political program. Uh, yes, the aristocracy is more, I mean, again, he was a bit of a snob, really. Uh, Mm -hmm. there, are all, uh, there are many other passages where <laughs> his friends are diplomats. Actually, incidentally, of yeah. all the uh, myriad of characters described in two books, I've actually met one. Uh, oh. He describes um, when he was actually, that's in um, Kaput, uh, there was a diplomat, so when you talk about his friends, um, Augustine de Foxa, who was a Spanish diplomat, also a witty conversation. There was another one, Philip von Fuso, of Baron Vietnam, who was an Italian diplomat, and he was actually Italian representative in Hungary, in Budapest. Later on after the war, he became and was elected member of parliament for the far right movement, uh, MSI, movement, social movement. And um, I met him at um, some event organized by some uh, far right friends. And I'd already read um, well, part of it. I remember asking him something, and uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was obviously a little bit um, stuck up. But uh, he said, oh, there's another part of it. Yeah, that would be exaggerated. Uh, so I met one character with a whole cast of characters. But again, they're all uh, aristocrats, ambassadors, diplomats, uh, princes, princesses, dukes, uh, duchesses. Uh, did the, did, the, did the description of the man correspond with uh, how he seemed to be? Well, I'm also described as, um, they called him Ben Filippo, uh, the handsome Filippo. He was um, a handsome man in a kind oh, okay. of, um, say, Italian kind of way. What is an Italian kind of way? What well, seems um, entirely appropriate, yes. Well, I mean, I'm, um, well, I'm no longer handsome, I'm afraid. Mm. But um, um, I think Amfusa came from Sicily. Sicily. Mm. Mm. My, Michael, uh, d uh, in London, I mean, do, do you have any thoughts? Uh... Uh, <clears throat> not really, no, it was fascinating. I, I didn't know uh, the writer at all, either. Um, the interesting thing for me was the, uh, the selling of children in Naples. Uh, what, what is the country where that's happening right now? Is it Myanmar? Where, uh, Afghanistan, it? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Right, yeah, Afghanistan. I, I heard something about that as well. Yeah. Uh, and I yeah. couldn't remember where it was. Yeah, because I, of just extreme poverty that mm. their families mm. are mm. having to do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we, we, I in many ways, time ago, a man in Nigeria who was um, arrested because he tried to sell his son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think that's yeah. quite widespread. I mean, I can entirely understand it, really. If, if it's a struggle to, to keep, uh, to, to, to put food on the plate, uh, it, yeah. Uh, and even to feed the child. I mean, you sometimes yeah, exactly. to sell the oh. child so um, that it can be fed. Indeed. I mean, th there are circumstances in which it could yeah. actually be of benefit to the future life of the child, it, it, paradoxically, mm. yeah. Well, um, hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, if it was being, yeah, obviously not perhaps in the context that you spoke about with these Moroccan soldiers, um, but... Uh, uh -huh. uh, you know. But it has, I mean, it has always happened. There's always been debt bondage, hasn't there? Yeah. I mean, people are banging sense. on about Atlantic slavery at the moment as if it was the only slavery that ever mm. existed. Yeah. Um, let's, not, let's not start on that. But, <laughs> yeah. but in terms of a larger picture, yeah. um, Slavery has been the, the fate of conquered peoples. Oh, absolutely. Pr prisoners yeah. of war, people conquered in cities. Yeah. Um, and as, and as oh, I would say, de debt bondage, when people simply cannot yeah. feed their family, then, and, and often uh, it, it's also covered in, in a different, um, 
a different economic system. Um, so I don't know, temporary fostering or something of this sort where there would be a financial mm -hmm. consideration. Involved. Well, there's allegations now that Ukrainian, especially Ukrainian oh, women are yeah. potentially becoming part of the slave trade. Yep. So it's it's something that's very real and continuing, always yes. has. Yeah. I, I was uh, reading Barry Cunliffe's book about the history of the Celtic peoples, and it became absolutely tedious to listen to because it was just a succession of, of one group of people defeating another and enslaving them and then being defeated down the line and being enslaved. And uh, mm. it, it was just the way, as you said, Prudence, the way things mm. were. Uh, all of us, um, I'm sure, here will have had lots of ancestors who were slaves of various kinds. It's just yes. the nature of, 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 of humanity. Yes, I mean, um, I actually gave a talk about slavery some time ago to a philosophy group that did a bit of research, but uh, Prudence is absolutely right. I mean, the slavery was, uh, I mean, uh, lots of uh, Europeans were captured mm. by Barbary pirates and taken to, <laughs> to yeah. Algiers and Tours yes. and enslaved. Um, yeah, yes. I mean, particularly uh, from Iceland, actually, and yes, uh, yes. one of their very famous poets, um, you know, his, 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 um, his wife, I think, was a, was, was a slave that, that was recovered, oh. and yeah, I mean, it's actually quite a oh. big... The cathedral, the... wasn't the cathedral founded by him? The yes, um, Halgrim Peterson, yeah, That's uh, it. a very, very good poet, very mm. good poet. Uh, but, and yeah, of course, was... Mozart wrote his opera, The Abduction from the Seraglio, about the... <laughs> The North African yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good trade. point, good point, <laughs> yes, indeed. It's interesting that uh, Aristotle, for example, defended slavery, mm. he claimed that there were people who were slaves by nature, yeah, and um, and but um, of course, anybody who was captured in war in the ancient world could become a slave, mm. and that was a famous case because the Greeks were supposed to be not slaves by nature, but when um. <laughs> Alexander the Great took, um, I think, I think it was a city of Thebes. I think it was Thebes. Oh. Which, I mean, uh, the, 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 the adult males were killed, and women and children were sold into slavery. And there were yes. Greeks. Yes. Mm -hmm. this, this was normal. It, I mean, the interesting thing for me about about all this um, is is that at some point in Europe in the late eighteenth century, this universal practice became abhorrent and at the same there was <clears throat> around 1750 people stopped um sort of judicial torturing to death in public i mean hanging drawing and quartering mm -hmm. is what happened for example to the um uh, 1745 jacobite rebellion um the, the people who, who who lost um, people were flogged in public and just hideous punishments in France, particularly people actually tortured to death for the entertainment of crowds. And then somehow, during, around 1750, over a few decades after that, all of this stopped and people started looking at um, slavery generally and saying that this is abhorrent as well, which is something I, I suspect, I mean, I certainly think I'm, I'm a creature of my time and in my gut I think slavery is a, a horrible thing but yet it's it's only really since that time the mid 18th century when somehow the tenor of the age changed in Europe and then of course we exported it to to much of the rest of the world by force so what was, happened what was behind it what do you do you know what is it an enlightenment uh Concept? Um, enlightenment, yes, um, but where did the enlightenment come from? I mean, was it Freemasonry, Free, Freemasonry as well? Um, because the early Masons were quite revolutionary in many ways. Yeah. Your, your point, uh, I take it, Prudence, which I, I think is an interesting mm. one, that it was relatively quickly this process happened. Is, is yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean the other yeah, thing yeah, is yeah. the other thing is that um, slavery everywhere until about seventeen seventy was either practiced or condoned all yeah. around the world, mm. um, and black Africans had been selling other black Africans to whoever would buy them for millennia anyway. Mm. Um, but 
um, the curious thing is that in Western Europe, in Catholic Europe, from about 1200 onwards, it was decided that a variety of church decrees said it, it was immoral to enslave Christians. So Christians couldn't be enslaved. So in practice, there was, uh, in theory at any, any rate, in, um, in the law, there was no slavery in Europe from uh, over the years, this, this came in bit by bit. Um, and, so, and so Europe was not a slave owning society. There were things like the feudal system and so on. And, uh, well, again, debt bondage didn't really happen. It was covered up in different um, sorts of legal organization. It, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, so I would throw in my, my, my mm. answer. But I think that was an interesting point that you make. Mm. How did things happen so quickly? Mm. Might be uh, the very swift development of the idea of property rights, including your own body. Ah. Ah, uh, if okay. you look at the writings of, of Locke, uh, mm. and yeah, or certainly of the Enlightenment, but also of a whole series of writers and thinkers and the Bill of Rights, the Glorious Revolution, which established property rights as a confirmation of the one part of the rebellion right. against the king, which was entirely accepted that the king could not dispense with anybody's property just as he pleased because he was making a war in Ireland or whatever. Uh -huh. So it was a sort of return to the Magna Carta, but with this additional element of the fact that everybody has at least the right to their little area of themselves, even if they don't own a house or something. And then immediately the question arises, can you just put this person up and torture them to general entertainment when that is an infringement on their property, their body, their feelings? That, that would be my quick reaction without having really thought about what, it. What about, what about Rome once it converted to Christianity? I mean, we don't tend to associate right. slavery as continuing. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. It yeah. did, even yeah. under the Christians. Even yes. when it was, when Rome became yes. a Christian state. Yes, and um, and Charlemagne had slaves. And, uh, right. uh, that, that's yeah. later. That's later. All right. That's later. But, but um, St. Paul said, oh, was it St. Paul? One of the saints said, slaves obey your masters one of the Christian mm. fathers of the church. So mm. it was just accepted as part, part of the economic system. Yeah. Well, I mean, let us remember that without slavery, these mm. ancient societies could not have survived. Mm. Uh, these yeah, slaves yeah. were, someone says slaves, uh, were the machines of the ancient world. Mm. Mm. They yes. were essential to the economy of those countries. It's interesting, uh, your point, uh, Prudence, about uh, slavery beginning to wane away in the middle uh, mm. the 18th, 18th century. That is also the rise of industrial revolution. Yeah, sure. yeah. so ah, they, yes. They had, um, you know, Seems, they, yeah. they, they had, you know, kind of industrial proletariat who was doing the oh, job yes. and yes. more machines to do the job. They didn't need, certainly not in, in England, the kind of um, uh, slaves uh, which um, uh, mm. were necessary to get things going in the ancient world, where there were no machines. Yes. Not yes. in the modern sense, anyway. Yes, I, I think this. I think this has been suggested. Yes, it's a, a bit disputed, but it seems. I agree with you, Father Frank. It seems. It seems likely. I hadn't thought about though, the property rights, the rights over the body. Michael, and, that, and that's from Locke. Which, of course, by definition, the slave has 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 no, no right to his body, whereas even the wage earner has a right to his body. Yes. Um, and that is the crucial difference, because wage earners were often, of course, as the proponents of slavery, were not slow to point out, for example, in the War of Succession in America, uh, that the, the ah. slave in the southern states was better off than the proletariat in the northern states. And that yes. is definitely a material fact. But it ignores mm. the fact a little bit that the, the slave in the southern states did not have an inherent right to his or her own body in any yes. way. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, sorry. I mean, I think one of the reasons of the revulsion against slavery in contemporary times is because, again, in modern era, it's been associated with a particular race. Even yeah. if they're mm. well, not just, but I mean, so mm. it's a notion of a race. And the Americans are all very mm. sort of conscious of this, are very hung up, I would say. 
But historically, slavery had nothing to do with a particular race. No. In the ancient world, anybody, you could be as white as the dream of snow, you were captured in war, you became a slave. A slave. <laughs> I just an anecdote about slavery and Christianity, of course, since Augustine didn't seem very bothered about slavery when he's reported to have seen the uh, Anglo-Saxon slaves in the oh. slave market, he just said, how oh, Beautiful well, uh, they were, yes, which yes. today might be a bit of a problematical comment, <laughs> and then said, "Oh, well, you know, let's convert them to Christianity." He does there's nothing. No account well, about it. Is, saying, is, you know, as you know, that, that is not said to the famous theologian Saint mm. Augustine of Hippo. That is sent to another Saint Augustine, yeah. uh, the other one that came. Yeah, the one that became. Yeah, the one that became but, Pope, and also, mm -hmm. you could say mm -hmm. there is another sideline. You could, you know, I just mean, say there is. These children, or young boys, were so handsome, so beautiful, <laughs> that they, they got to be Christians. A race which is so handsome has to be Christian. Has to be Christian. Yeah, you pun on an Angli and Angeli, the yes, angels yes, and angles. on Angli and Angeli, yes. But he wasn't bothered about the slavery. I mean, no. Oh, well, yeah. um, it was not I mean, his conceptual. I'm, you know, coming, coming in again, though, um, I, I'm wondering, I, I'm wondering if, when um, slavery of Christians became de facto not the thing to do in, in the high medieval age and early modern age, I wonder if slavery of enslaving other people was justified because they were heathens. I wonder if, you know, the, um, the abolition of slavery was uh, um, in the 18th century was largely tied up with especially non-conformist Christianity. It was a, a strongly Christian driven movement. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if ironically, the original um, justification of slavery among people who said it was an insult to the, um, the image of man made in the image of God um, was because these people were, were heathen and therefore deserved it. It's interesting, uh, Prudence, you mentioned it was an unconformist thing. I, could, I lived in Clapham as a student. There was a famous um, yeah. um, there's a school uh, devoted to one of the Clapham sect who were evangelical mm. Christians, some of whom fought uh, the abolished slavery. Mm. But um, I always have often had a puzzle. I mean, your quotation about the image of God is pertinent, of course. But I mean, there isn't really a divine command in the Bible forbidding slavery. No. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, no. Uh, the Hebrews had slaves. I don't know, Joshua seemed to think it was a pretty good thing. He kept destroying cities, and it's said that the, the, <laughs> the men were all put to the sword, and the women so the slavery, and, 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 and was, God found it good. And there was, I think it's in Genesis, a reference to a, a Gideonite. It was so low, they were slave slaves. <laughs> oh dear, that's really low. Oh, no, yeah. yes. Uh, well, not lower than slaves of the slaves of the slaves. Again, to make, you, uh, to make you um, well, laugh for her too, uh, I, this talk which I gave to a small philosophy group oh. was a defense of a possibility of voluntary slavery. Oh. Okay. Because, uh, it, was actually, it was initially based on a line in a book by the philosopher Robert Nozick, who was a very bright uh, contemporary philosopher. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And Nozick mentioned that that is because he has a, a particular philosophy of rights. And mm. now, um, if, you would, if one might have a right to sell oneself into slavery, now, you would like, mm -hmm. who would want to do that? Well, I mean, uh, I can imagine possibly imagine circumstances in which it would be a good idea to sell oneself into slavery. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if one thought that the, the person one was selling one into the, the authority of was a better manager, manager of one's life than oneself. And uh, yeah, there are I, the relationship is between it to look like a child and a parent almost. I don't know really. Uh, I, I, Oh. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I certainly agree agree with that. Uh, but I, I mean, because I, I don't have this sense that what defines a human being is the faculty of choosing, which is what the current kind of in, in individual culture is about. I think it's, oh. I don't know what it is, but it's. I don't think it's that. I think we are rather obsessed by this idea of individuality as as the. Uh, choosing facility but it's it's interesting where we've got to and i'm sure um, the writer will be very pleased with that wouldn't he uh, right. uh, 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 and that that's evidence of the of, of the power of his work maybe I mean, yeah, absolutely yeah. he works pretty well 
Yeah. Mm. Um, certainly so stimulated I... me into adding it to my already far too large collection of books. Yeah. Wow. Maybe that's a good point uh, upon which we should go and uh, prepare our afternoon tea. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Excuse me, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, it's like Sabine. Sabine. Return. Oh, oh, Sabine. I'm new with all this technology, so I'm also very shy. Uh, but, but you're a journalist, you should yeah, not be new. <laughs> but very old fashioned. Uh, I just wanted to say, I mean, slavery just went into colonialism. No, it didn't. Slavery stopped. Oh. <laughs> it, I mean, here in Berlin was the Congo Conference, 1885, oh. and Europe decided to separate all of mm. Africa. So, I mean, slavery just uh, moved into a different state. Like the Congo is giving all the coltan for our uh, mobile phones, for our technology. Mm. Four million Congolese died to give us our minerals. Oh. And also when the car was invented and we needed the, uh, the rubber for our wheels of our cars, mm. already many million of Congolese died. So it, uh, slavery transformed. We just didn't want to see it anymore. We just mm. exported it somehow. Yeah, this is it's probably it's persisted. Well, there was sure that was a Marxian yeah. concept of, yeah, the, yeah. of wage slavery, uh, isn't it? The, the, uh, in fact, they, the, the, you're a slave if you don't earn yeah. um, the results of your work and just uh, have to benefit from what the capitalist gives you. I mean, that was, uh, was Marx himself developed that theory. And I think in the Congo, ago. I mean, the Congo was particularly brutal. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think in the Congo, well, part, partly it was the King of the Belgians, wasn't it, who had yeah. his own um, abode, but also other people, in, including um, the, uh, the, the head of future Unilever, Lord Lever, um, yeah. set out what he thought was going to be a rather paternalistic, um, again, a, a kind of Christian paternalistic, um, good working, um, arrangement for the Congolese who were, I suppose, tapping rubber. And he found he just he he just couldn't do this given the society that was there. He, he found himself drawn into working with the, the brutal enslavement of Congolese workers by other Congolese people because that's how they ran it. Yeah. So it, it's it's a bit complex, but yes, I mean I, I agree there was a lot of turning turning a blind eye to to local customs. And we are still profiting because they do the very cheap labor mm. and we get it for very cheap, all our technology. So it's still this, this kind of, we are profiting from it. But there's not quite ownership of bodies. Yeah, that's more like a, a critique of capitalism. Well, I, I, it, it goes mm. back to, to almost we come full circle to, to Palovich saying, I want to be a father to my people and having this basket full of eyes. Ah, yes. uh, I was very suspicious of people who they say they want to be father to the people. They're usually going to have things like that. But it does sort of suggest, um, that's the last point I did want to throw in, which struck me very much with Mother Party, is this use of almost this the grotesque and the euphemism that can hide such horrors and the extent to which, how much mm. do you believe them? And this is always the story of every atrocity and horror. To what extent is it burlesque and to what extent is it real? And the extent to which horrors mm. are, are, are hidden by language. Yes. Um, and I'll throw in an anecdote very briefly. Um, the biologist Russell Foreman uh, accounts for his travels in New Guinea in, I think, the 1950s. And he was given meat to eat, which he thought was quite good. And it, and they said it was long pig. It was a special oh, kind of no. long pig. Yes. <laughs> and he realised later that long pig was probably their euphemistic expression for human flesh. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, 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 mm. there again, you don't know how much to believe it. It's almost a malaparte anecdote, isn't it? Mm. Um, so I think this is the point. And with all these atrocities, also including the Congo, I am always torn between not rejecting and not accepting, but probably it's it's like this Malaparte thing. There's a truth which is expanded or turned into burlesque in order to shock people. Um, sometimes you hope that anyway, because otherwise, you know. But ah. they, also this use of atrocity, the way the Japanese described in their experiment camps that the humans referred to as logs because they had apparently their experiment camp was disguised 
uh, for the benefit of publicity in the world as, as a logging, which is in ah. itself a sort of bizarre and cruel humour. Ah. Um, so, yes, so I just sort of I threw that in. Yeah. Of, of, Can, we it's, Can we finish? Yeah, I don't, we could talk all, well, I could talk exactly. for a long time. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank ta 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 thanks so much. I think we've all been. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you yeah. very much, Father Frank. Oh, I just want to say thank for uh, next meeting of Soteria before we go. Um, so you can put it in your diaries early. It should be very, very interesting. It's on the 22nd of May, the same time with Hewitt Wilkinson, who is vice chairman of the De Vere Society. The De Vere Society upholds the belief that uh, William Shakespeare was, in fact, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he sounds like a pretty big cheese in other fields. He's a co-chairman of the EPN, which is the, oh, what is it? The Association for Integrational Psychotherapy, I think. Uh -huh. And he's written quite a lot and it should be a very interesting talk. And I- The name is de Vere Wilkinson. No, 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 no. Uh, the society is the De Vere Society, and Edward De Vere, and his name is Heward, H-E-W-A-R-D, Wilkinson. Oh, yes. uh, uh, I'm afraid you have to count me out of that one because I, I'm not, um, I don't like my man, but that's enough. <laughs> oh, you okay. know him, how very interesting. No, 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 I don't want to have to do with the uh, man. Anyway. Okay, sorry. Well, that that say, should say, interest everyone else. I mean, that is a really. Uh, I have to say, I'm okay. a man of strong. Uh, uh, of <laughs> oh, okay. well, you, you know this man. Oh, okay. Okay, this is absolutely amazing. God bless you all. God bless you all. God bless you all. Thank you. 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 With a very sort of malaparte statement. Fascinating statement to finish with, yet. Yes, I think I think that is wonderful. Um. Um, I or mainly, I suppose mainly Prudence and slightly Father Frank. It, it, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to send out a message about Pavel Horak, the researcher oh, yes. who's mm -hmm. at Cambridge at the moment writing a book. And I, I'd like to know how many people would be oh. a, able to see him on the 27th of um, April in the usual venue in London, because I okay. don't want to. I, I don't want to... Pavel has got in touch with me. I must. I must write back to him. Oh, that, good. I don't want to hire the room for a hundred pounds and only three people turn up because. Who is the speaker again? Pavel Horak. He's a Czech academic who's got a very distinguished record. I think he'll be talking about uh, uh, pagan-related belief structures. So maybe, I mean, Father Frank, it won't be so much interest, but um, uh, you know, I, I, so I, I'll be sending this out soon, but. Uh, I'll, I'll put that in a message, but it's mainly for you, Prudence, and may, maybe you, Alison. I know you live a long way away. Yeah, but, um, um, it's very close to. I'm, I'm, I've just moved house, so. Bye bye, bye bye, Father Frank. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, um, it's quite close. I'm, I'm in a panic about getting ready for this fringe, but I'd like to. I play that by ear because it sounds interesting. But I could. Can I let you know later? Is that okay? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you, if you, if yeah, I'll be sending oh. out a message soon. But um, yeah. Um, um, God, I think everyone else is, is, is abroad, but um, oh, I'm glad you've been in touch with him, Prudence. No, that, yes. that's good. I, yes. you know, he's, he's a good ah. good guy. I mean, he's you live in Cambridge. Yes, you know? I do. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. you can m meet him for a cup of tea or something. Well, that, that's what he's inviting me to do. So I go. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, do that. Yeah. Anyway, going to be away for the next week, so so I'll, I'll sign off now. And okay. All the best to all of you. Thanks so okay. much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Um, bye, bye. Oh, yeah, nice to everyone. Yeah, yeah and, thanks and very much for coming. Everyone. Thanks, Stead, for managing, and thanks to Father Frank, he's gone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, yeah. Hey, now, anyway. Yeah, that was that was quite. Sorry, did 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 did, he, did Father Frank said he actually knew the Yes, the I, a most extraordinary and fascinating. I thought he was going to say that he had no interest in the Devere, and he was against Position. people who doubted Shakespeare. Yeah. Thought, okay, that's quite enough. usual. And he reacted very strongly and said, no, no, it was this man. And I, I, I couldn't imagine that they knew each other. So I'm, and quite a yeah. mystery there. It's kind of, yeah, per yeah perfect that, ending if, really, isn't it? I'm why why don't we ask um, ask the gentleman himself? Uh, well, no, he might not come then, for heaven's sake. You're joking. No, I mean, if he's if he's ever sort of, uh, no, maybe it might be. No, a, no, 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 no. Obviously <laughs> something very wrong there. If we ask him, we've lost the speaker stone. Quite obviously. But not that he would be coming, but saying that Frank Gurney would not be coming. Uh, well, know. I see what you mean. Yeah, no, I would leave that till after he's done it, I think. I don't know. Yeah.
Yeah. Or, or, quite quite a mystery there. Yeah. That, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll ask him. You know, I'll ask him. I mean, I can't know. imagine how they their paths could have crossed. That they're, they're not in the same same sphere of interest or world. Yeah. I would have yeah. Thought, yeah. That, that, that sounds very curious. What what uh, would Father Frank, you know, um, be be so concerned about that that the other gentleman would would somehow... I, I absolutely yeah. don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, Hewitt Wilkins said I've only, I haven't even properly met, I've seen him at two conferences yeah. and he's very committed to the Shakespeare debate and he uh, seems to be highly intelligent and I couldn't really say much more about him than that. I suspect it's uh, a mis mistake of a, of a name, a confusion of names somehow. I've got to say, almost it must be. I can't imagine. Yeah, I don't I'll... know that, that Hewitt Wilkinson is involved in anything <laughs> extremely controversial. I don't know of any scandal attaching to uh, him. I know nothing. But I, yeah, I don't I mean, know. Him. Father so, Frank is, you described him, a, a controversialist who occasionally um, takes positions that, that may not be to everyone's liking. Um, and yeah, I, Wil, Wil, Wilkinson is not an uncommon name, is it? Yeah, it could be a misunderstanding. Yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's very likely. It's a nice way to end, isn't it? With that kind of mystery, <laughs> that sort of slightly sinister mystery at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, 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 that's good. Oh, okay, that's good. Well, good, good stuff. Um, yeah, it was nice great stuff, it. wasn't it? I probably really am going to buy these two books now, although I shouldn't. I'm always yeah. getting problems with Anya about the number of books here. She says there's a crack in the ceiling. From the weight of books and uh, but they do sound he does sound like a fascinating writer yeah um, yeah i oh, would have to put 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 some books in the basement then yeah oh there are books in the basement they're the ones i don't read very much yeah. um yeah, but yeah i'm sure i'm sure there's another solution now yeah uh, we'll have to think about it yeah yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> uh have a good sunday nice to yeah, see you yeah same to you thanks for managing bye -bye. everything so well said particularly well, at the well, last well. moment with those things on screen and did very well yeah not too bad okay. thank you it was very oh. fascinating and mesmerizing wonderful yeah, i thought oh. it was i definitely thought it was very good and the only oh, bad so thing about it is such a challenge to everyone yeah. else you know if someone as good as the way he did it it yeah. kind of almost makes other people shy because it's a um, so, so sabine would you like if you'd like to come to some more then please get um let, let, give us your email address and I mean give your email address to Michael and we can put you uh -huh. on the mailing list mm -hmm. that, that yeah. would be <laughs> yeah just write write it in chat maybe um, or in oh. chat yeah absolutely yeah. Oh, yeah I don't know how to do it maybe Father Frank can do it um, well if you tell 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 us what it is we can write it down uh, yeah my email yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, Sabine yeah underline Matthews, mm -hmm. yeah, at hotmail, M A T T H, yes, yeah, at at hotmail.com. Okay, that's oh, right. easy, that's no so problem. So it, it's just Sabina Ma uh, Matthews, underline Matthews, underline yes. Matthews. Oh, I under oh, okay, so there's an underscore between the E and yeah. the M, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. okay, fine. Okay, I've got that there. What will happen, Sabina? You'll get invitations to each. Uh, Sartoria, Sartoria, everybody's mm. in a blind copy so they don't see anybody else's address but I send out to everybody who's on the list the invitation so you get an invitation for example to the next one on the 22nd of May oh thank you not at all <laughs> no problem yeah and, and if I may I'll put you on the maidenness for the the moots which are uh, more intellectual discussions of ideas or presentations oh. and that, that, that they've got a more religious character if you if you really dislike anything religious is is that the case then i won't put you on but uh no which I... I like religious and surrealistic and strange things oh okay i don't know about the strange <laughs> things but if you're yeah um yeah the, the, the yeah that the matters of some spiritual content uh but in, interpreted in quite a wide wide yeah. uh oh, okay just yeah, to state, state, I, 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 if i could correct your pronunciation i think you said it's a the mood is it's more intellectual stuff. It's not more intellectual. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, a fi uh, fine point there. Um, it, it, yes. Uh, ideally, th th these topics are concerned with literature uh, and ways of expression in 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 aesthetic terms. 
although they do obviously contain ideas as today we've been talking about slavery i was so just teasing you about the first yeah sound, yeah it's an interesting point of difference between more intellectual and more intellectual yes i, I yeah no i i, of course, I, I okay. appreciate your, your i appreciate that yeah. i hope, I hope. That, that's clear. Okay. Well, so and uh, yeah, no, nice, nice to have you on board, Andre, as well. Thanks yeah. for, thanks for uh, your presence. All right, we'll we'll go and get a nice. cup of tea yeah. or coffee or, or tea or, and coffee time. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Coffee and kuchen. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, it was great meeting you guys. It was no, very our pleasure. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, Alfie Dzine. Alfie. Alfie Dzine. Alfie Dzine. Cheers. Okay.